So um, it's now my pleasure to uh, finally stop talking and uh, start to turn, turn things over to the reason that, that you're all here. Um, I'm really excited uh, to, to hear today's speaker, um, Dr. Nicole Holliday, University of Pennsylvania. And uh, we'll be talking, or her title of her talk is, it's in the tone. So Dr. Holliday, I turn this over to you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, it's such a joy to join you all today um, and be part of this International Year of Sound. Hopefully now you can see um, my slides, all right. So uh, I get to start this talk with my second favorite way of starting talks, um, comedy, which we can all use a little more of now. But comedy can actually tell us a lot about how people use language. Um, we know that the public is aware of systematic linguistic variation and comedic interpretations provide evidence of this, right? So in the English speaking world, a lot of comedy relies on things like wordplay, but also on the cultural assumptions that we make about how people use language. Um, it's so important, in fact, that it is in the very first clip that the comedians Key and Peel ever performed on their sketch show. So yes, you get to watch Key and Peel in an academic talk. Um, I want you to pay attention to a couple things uh, while we watch this short clip. Um, we, I want you to note how Key, he's the tall one, and Peel, the short one, um, change as they move in physical space towards and away from each other. Um, and think about why this might be. All right, so let's watch some Key and Peel. Okay, so why is this funny, right? Um, I could write, you know, probably tomes on what's going on on this uh, Key and Peel sketch, but we at first see Key having a conversation with his girlfriend, wife, whatever, um, about some theater tickets, right? So what he's talking about is coded implicitly as upper middle class and white, and he's using something like a mainstream kind of variety of English. But as Peel approaches him and as they get closer and the longer they stay in proximity, they move towards an exaggerated version of African-American language, and they do this for each other performatively. And the, the punchline then of course is as Peel walks away, he is moving into a different style, right? We didn't really hear him before except for in contrast to Key. And as he moves away, he does yet another style, right? Um, and betrays what he thinks uh, Key was doing, right? So they're both kind of forming a, a hyper-exaggerated stereotype gangster persona. But it's not just in the words, right? It has to do with the way that they are um, holding their bodies in the physical space, but also the properties of the voices itself. Um, and that's what I'm particularly interested in. So, um, all right. How do we study these things though, right? They're so intuitive to us, but we don't really know how to quantify them. First of all, um, as Andrew said, the Acoustical Society has all kinds of folks in it, right? Engineers, physicists. Um, so I'm not gonna assume that you know what linguistics is. Um, a lot of people don't. Um, when I teach introduction to linguistics, uh, I always ask the students on day one, what is linguistics? And I get like blank stares. What did you sign up for? Um, it is, the approach of language with scientific method, methods and rigor from both theoretical and applied approaches, sort of maximally broad. And then within that, we narrow down a little bit. Um, there are the traditional, what we call a formal subfield. So these include things like phonology, which is how sounds are organized in a language and across languages. Um, morphology, which is how we put sounds together to form the building blocks of languages. Um, which are words, syntax, which is how we put words together, and then semantics, which deals with um, the formal study of meaning. But there's a whole other set of things that linguists do, um, building on some of the theoretical uh, fields that are more experimental or applied. Um, so I situate myself as a sociolinguist. So we look at how language operates on society and how society operates on language, um, linguistic anthropology, um, psycho and neurolinguistics, both that deal with the mind and the brain and how language is processed and produced, um, and computational linguistics, which you'll be familiar with. Um, you see my captioning happening uh, automatically via PowerPoint right now. Linguists were involved in that. All right. Um, what does any of this have to do with acoustics? 
A lot. Okay, so one subfield I didn't mention when I was talking about the more experimental things is phonetics. Um, a lot of the uh, linguists that you'll see in the Acoustical Society are phoneticians. So I will revise my earlier statement and say that I self-identify as a socio-phonetician. We're interested in the physical properties of sound and sort of the all of the interfaces with that, um, as well as some computational uses. And in my case, the social application. So what does the, the physical properties of sound have to do with the way that we look at how language operates in society? Uh, I want to give you a little bit of an idea of my research before I tell you about a few specific uh, studies that I think will be of interest. So I broadly study four things. Um, variation among people with multiple complex racial identities, um, which it turns out is everyone. <laughs> um, so lots of people have uh, really complex identities that we're starting to be able to unpack more. I was really struck yesterday. Um, I'm, I'm obsessed with politicians. That's one of the prongs of this. And um, I was watching the DNC and how Kamala Harris was presenting herself and how she was being presented. So I'm interested in how people do that kind of work with language. Um, intonation and theory and practice. So how the way that the voice moves tells us things about um, social factors, variation among politicians. Uh, you'll see some Obama in this talk. Very exciting. And linguistic discrimination and profiling. So uh, when we know that people have social judgments about the physical properties of language, what effects does that have on society? And how do they make these judgments? Um, I use acoustics to address all of these types of questions. And so I'll talk about a few different ones in turn. Um, to start with the sort of sociolinguistics of it, um, I have to present to you AAL. Um, and so uh, variationist sociolinguistics aims to describe systematic group level differences in linguistic patterns. And indeed, the early studies uh, in this subfield uh, focused mo mostly on broad demographic categories like region, class, and race. Um, in the United States, uh, these types of studies began increasing in popularity in the mid 20th century. And this actually becomes really important for the kind of work that I do. One motivation of some of the early studies was understanding differences between black and white children in education, especially post formal integration, post Civil Rights Act um, in the 1960s. So all of a sudden we had black and white children in school, but their linguistic differences were causing them to operate differently in institutions and also to have um, different outcomes, right, to perpetuate inequality. Um, so the linguists started to get really interested in these types of questions, and this forms the basis for a lot of the sociolinguistic research that's done uh, in the United States. Indeed, um, the most well-studied variety uh, in the United States beyond the standard mainstream thing is African-American language, um, and this is sort of where that comes from. Um, it, it is one of the most well-studied varieties, but it also remains very heavily stigmatized. Uh, I probably don't need to persuade you of this, but I will. Uh, so here are some random tweets uh, that you can find if you search uh, African-American vernacular English, African-American English, or Eponics on Twitter. You get things like this. So in the top left, uh, we have a user that says, I hate it when people speak Ebonics. The tone, the slang, the grammar errors, all of it makes me cringe. I hate this tweet. I'm so angry at this person. Um, but it's interesting because a lot of times when people make the claim that they hate the way that black people speak, whatever they call it, a elebonics, whatever, they're usually only saying the second thing that Courtney says, right? It's slang or there's grammar errors, but she specifically picks up on the tone. Why is the tone something that bothers her? Um, in the middle, we're getting a little more information. How to speak Ebonics. Put some bass in your voice. Make all pronouns singular and all verbs present tense and then mumble. Well, guess what? In classes that I teach, I give a quiz on the structure of African American language, and this person would fail it because that is not at all what happens in AAL. It's not like all pronouns are suddenly singular. Um, and I don't have any idea what people mean when they say bass in their voice, but this is a really common stereotype about the way that black speakers use language. Um, and then here in the bottom right, we have a, a sort of different take on it. Uh, anything is possible when you don't use your ebonics voice on the phone, right? So somebody, again, talking about the voice, implicitly talking about the acoustics, um, when in fact people tend to pick on the grammar, there's something bigger that people are picking up on with the voice. And that is what I'm really interested in. 
Um, so yeah, people don't usually have positive feelings about African American speakers. Um, it's just racism, that's it. Um, so given these linguistic facts, how do speakers adapt linguistically? Uh, I wanna tell you about this guy. Uh, Obama says, you go to the cafeteria and the black guys are sitting here, uh, white, black kids are sitting here, white kids are sitting there, and you gotta make some choices. It became a matter of being able to speak different dialects. That's not unique to me. Any black person in America who's successful has to be able to speak several different forms of the same language. It's not unlike a person shifting between Spanish and English. All right, so for this reason, I like to call Obama the code switcher in chief. He is articulating something that we are all familiar with, right? The fact that we don't use the same language to all of the different people that we talk to, but that in particular for black people and for other people of color, this um, linguistic flexibility is a survival strategy given the context we've seen the negative perceptions of AAL um, as presented on the last slide. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about code switching and style shifting um, and what that means because it'll lay the framework for the studies I'll tell you about. Um, so code switching, this is very confusing because I've recently uh, found out that it means something very different in the public than it does to linguists. So linguists, when they say code switching frequently mean moving between more than two or more languages in the same conversation. Um, that's like a very basic definition. But I think in the public discourse, when people say code switching, they don't only mean that. They frequently mean African-American speakers moving between um, some variety of AAL and some variety that they think of as mainstream, although linguists might be more likely to call this style shifting or something else. So uh, in going forward, I'm going to use code switching the way that the public does. Um, to refer to in between varieties. Um, do we do these things with the sounds themselves as well as the words? Because when I've asked people, okay, do you talk differently with your white and black friends? This is a real thing that I ask in studies. And they'll say, yeah. And I'll say, okay, cool. What do you change? And they'll say, I don't know. It's like the words, but it's not just the words. It's the voice as we saw with Key and Peele. Um, I want to show you a recent Twitter thread with some fascinating examples from the public. And in fact, I have uh, some work under review that looks at this thread. So let me share this with you. Um, and this is proof of how sort of enregistered code switching is. This your girl, Ebony. This is the code switch thread. I want to hear how y'all sound with your regular voice versus when you have to code switch or your work voice. I want to hear the difference. And so I'll go first. Uh, this is how I sound when I'm not clocked in, and this is how I sound when I am. Good morning. Thank you for calling. How can I help you? Um, I don't know what else to say, but this is the voice that I tend to use. And so now it's y'all's turn. I want to hear how do y'all sound different. Let me know. So this is hey y'all, this is Ebony this is here, um, who explains that she wants to hear how people code switch, and she puts it in a frame that's not exactly racialized explicitly, but rather, how do you talk at home versus how do you talk at work? Interestingly, almost everyone that replies to her um, presents themselves as a person of color, usually African American, and we know this because they've chosen memojis, right? So we're not seeing the physical people, we're seeing actually how people have racialized themselves in avatars, and then how those avatars represent the ways that they speak. And you'll notice maybe in Ebony's speech itself, she's not using a lot of what we would consider the stigmatized features of African-American English that, that those tweets referred to. It's her voice itself, the quality of her voice that changes. And that's what I'm really interested in. So if we scroll down, we see um, people kind of reply and they're like, this is so great, so fun. Other Memoji responses, right? So what I'm looking at is, what are the actual physical differences in tone, um, pitch, and voice quality across these, um, across these clips that people do differently with their home voice versus their work voice? Um, so let me go back to the slides. All right, there you go. Um, I'm really excited to see what happens with that data. Um, so we're thinking about code switching beyond words, and I want to tell you about the kind of variables that we look at when we do these studies. Um, so intonation and prosody are related to the movement of pitch through a phrase as well as other aspects of the voice itself, as opposed to the specific linguistic segments. So we're not thinking about like how people pronounce their aw or something like that. It's like over the whole phrase that is the point of interest here. 
Um, and those are the kind of variables that I usually look at. Um, it's very understudied despite all we know about variation. Uh, there's a lot of physics and this kind of data is really messy. You can imagine that if you're doing a study like this, and in fact this happened with some of the tweet data I was looking at, uh, if they're recording their Memoji talking about their home voice versus their work voice and their dog barks or a door opens or a truck drives by, the data is totally useless. And this is part of the reason um, that this, these kinds of variation remain really understudied. Um, but we know that intonational features are really salient in ethnic identification and that these have social consequences for speakers. So as we saw in the tweets, people talk about the tone. Even if the linguists don't really understand fully what's going on here and the people can't talk about it using metalinguistic awareness, they still have a feeling about it. And I want to show you a little bit what these differences look like. Um, these are some examples from um, my 2016 dissertation. Um, this is one speaker. He is biracial. Um, he identifies as black and white. And uh, you're looking at a spectrogram. Uh, he's going to say the management was. And you see that in the middle of the image. Above that is the spectrogram itself. The blue bar is the pitch, where the pitch moves up and down. And then you see the waveform about that, above that. Um, there's another one down here that does the same thing. The whole sentence is the management was really shady. But what he does when he says the management is just a simple rise, right? And what he does when he says the word really is a tiny little fall and then a rise. And they sound really different, um, not just in length, but also in the way that the tone moves itself. So I want you to listen to this speaker a couple of times. The management was really shady Nothing. but management was really shady so maybe you hear the difference between what he does on management and what he does on really that difference tends to be really salient um as a difference between speakers of like mainstream varieties and african-american language so it's that tiny but it's salient for listeners um, what have studies on intonation found? Significant differences between black and white speakers in things like pitch range, the timing of those pitch movements, and the quality of the voice itself. Um, and listeners usually can tell the difference between white and black voices, and they seem to rely specifically on acoustic information. And this includes the kind of small differences that we saw on the previous slides, so the difference between that simple rise and that fall rise, um, and the proportion that they get used in and where you use those in. Um, seem to be something that is diagnostic um, for speakers making racial identification judgments. Um, how does all of this affect the social part, right? We're always keeping this in mind because I'm doing sociolinguistics. Well, speakers can use this variation to construct and perform very, very specific identities and in, indeed different identities in different social contexts. Um, and listeners use this information to make social judgments. Sometimes it's helpful. Sometimes this information, uh, if we're talking to somebody on the phone, gives us a greater context for where the person is or who they are or something like that. It's not all bad. Um, sometimes it's really unhelpful. So when I talk to students, I'm like, okay, well, you know, we make judgments about people's gender, race, background, age, et cetera. And they go, oh no, judgments. I'm like, no, no, it's, they can be bad, but they can also be helpful. Um, but we have to look at the ways in which both of those things are true. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about two specific studies that illustrate this. We're gonna see some on Obama, and then we're gonna talk about um, what happens with Rachel, Rachel Jean Tell. Um, so the question of this study, uh, are listener judgments affected by intonational differences? So this is a study that came out earlier this year in laboratory phonology. Um, it's with my collaborator, Dan Villarreal, who is at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so we found that intonational manipulations can cause Obama to be judged as sounding blacker, which is strange because everybody knows Obama and exactly how black he is um, or not. Uh, we conducted an online survey with listeners and they were told that they would hear different clips of Obama saying different things. All they had to do was respond to the question, how black or white does Obama sound here on a unitless slider bar? So they just slide, Obama sounds more black here, whatever, and they hear one clip at a time. Um, I'm going to play for you the stimuli that they heard. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a stepwise manipulation. Um, in step one, this is the real pitch track. This is the unaltered audio of what Obama said. In step two, what we did was we made the maximum pitch a little higher and the minimum pitch a little lower. 
Um, the same thing in step three, we moved it up a little and we moved it down a little bit. If you want to know the specifics of this, we went one semitone up for every step and half a semitone down because we didn't want to bottom out his pitch range because he was already pretty low. Um, and then step four is the most extreme manipulation. So I'll play those and you'll hear them sequentially to see what this um, manipulation sounded like. They rotate. They rotate. They rotate. They rotate. Okay. <laughs> one more time. They rotate, they rotate, they rotate, they rotate. And maybe you can tell the difference between step one and four or between step one and three, but they're really not very extreme manipulations. However, when we played this um, in an experiment, we found that listeners, when they heard step four, were much more likely to say that Obama sounded blacker than in step one, which means that extreme pitch manipulations in this particular type of contour do tend to trigger racialized judgments. Pretty cool, right? Um, so yeah, listeners do evaluate Obama's voice differently when he uses different intonational patterns. And these acoustic, acoustic judgments exist in a racialized lens due to the social context. Um, but what kind of consequences can this have for everyday life? So I did this fun example. Well, okay, how black does Obama sound? Like, why do we care? Everybody knows that Obama is black and biracial and that's fine. So what happens when we do this in real life? Um, I'm gonna tell you a study about a study by Rickford and King um, that doesn't specifically focus on the acoustics, but where I think the acoustics are really important. So the three people that you're seeing uh, here are uh, on the left, Rachel Jean Tell, in the middle, Trayvon Martin, and on the right, George Zimmerman. Um, probably you will be familiar uh, with this case. Um, George Zimmerman was a neighborhood watch person uh, who thought that Trayvon Martin was suspicious, um, approached him, and they, uh, what ended up happening is that George Zimmerman shot him. Um, he was uh, put up for trial for murder um, for Trayvon Martin, and he was acquitted. Um, Rachel Jean Tell, you might not know if you're just kind of vaguely familiar with the story. She was Trayvon Martin's friend, and she was on the phone with him um, when he was murdered. So he was describing that he was being followed by George Zimmerman, and, and she's the last person that talked to him. Um, so for this reason, she was a key witness uh, in the murder trial. Um, so the key ear witness, because she heard what was happening. Um, in the Rickford and King paper, they focus on grammatical features and misunderstandings to make the argument that justice was not served in this case, and likely partially due to the judgments that people made about Rachel Gentel and the way that she used language. Um, they talk about a lot of specific stigmatized morphosyntactic features of African American language, so this kind of stuff that's in the grammar, but I think that there's things going on with the tone too. We see the possibilities for her voice and tone to be misinterpreted. Um, so I'm going to show you a quick clip um, so you can think about how she's treated and what conclusions do you think that the listeners jump to about her specifically based on her voice. So let's um, do this. It's just about 10 seconds. Hello. Ahead a little. Okay. What's one, one thing about what Trayvon Martin told you that made you think this was racial? Describing the person. Pardon me? Describing the person. I, I just didn't. Describing I, the person that was watching him and following him, I sir. See. Describing the person is what made you think it was racial? Yes. And that's because he just. So I'll stop this there. You don't need to see very much of this to understand what's happening, right? She's speaking well and she's speaking in her variety. She's using no stigmatized morphosyntactic features of African-American language here, but she keeps being asked to repeat herself. And when people are asked to repeat themselves multiple times, they get louder, but also there tends to be an, a, a judgment that they sound annoyed. Well, this girl at the time is 19 years old and she's on the stand for hours at a time in a courtroom where almost everyone in power is white. Her friend has been murdered, um, and the man who murdered him is sitting, sitting in front of her, and she's asked to repeat herself over and over and over again. And Rickford and King provide pretty good evidence that there was some linguistic bias against her in the way that people talk about her. So the members of the jury after the fact, as well as the lawyers, in addition to people on the internet who just say like, oh, she sounded so unprofessional, or we couldn't understand her, or all of this kind of stuff, um, and much, much worse. Um, so the, the main point here is 
the judgments that people had about her, the way in which she was linguistically profiled did have an effect on um, the outcome of the trial in this case and whether or not justice was served. Um, and this is happening, don't like get too sad, but this is happening everywhere in courtrooms across the entire country right now where black speakers are painted in this kind of way and it does affect the way that they are interpreted as credible or not credible. Um, so let me get out of here. Um, so yeah, this variation and its negative interpretation by citizens, voters, lawyers, jurors, and reporters can affect judicial outcomes um, in sort of the most extreme cases. And linguists have also observed this kind of bias at the level of grammar and at the voice itself in these domains. So in politics, right, um, I'm bracing myself for an entire, entire fall of hearing about how angry Kamala Harris sounds when she's not actually angry. Um, in education, right? So what happens to kids when they get misinterpreted in this way? In employment, in housing. Um, so the motivation for studying the acoustics of what's going on isn't just like, oh, cool, look what happens when we manipulate Obama's voice. Like, that is cool. But also this really has serious life and death effects for people and economic effects for people. Um, so I hate to end like this because it's like really a bummer, but I want to tell you about some things that you can do. You can educate yourself and your family on linguistic variation. I, my favorite quote in the world is variation at all levels is a feature, not a bug. So in the United States, there tends to be a bias such that there is a right way to speak. And not only that there's a right way to speak, but, but that those who don't employ the right way, the standard, are not uh, full members of society and or are in some way morally deficient. If we understand how variation works, if we understand that people just have different voices and different tones and that these things are uh, attached to other parts of their identity and their culture, maybe we don't necessarily need to talk about these things as though they're problematic. Maybe they're interesting. Maybe they're part of what makes us great, right? Um, and you can consider your own judgments and call out linguistic prejudice when you see it. So I can teach a whole semester of this stuff to students and still in week 14 get people say, oh yeah, but people from the South. We have these biases. I have these biases. I'm a person that grew up in this country. Of course I do, right? So whenever I make a judgment about a person, I try to step back and say, okay, is this something my, about the way that I feel about people from that group, or is it really about what there is going on with their language? We can do this, right? And advocate for the language rights and equal treatment of linguistic minorities in public spaces. So this applies to speakers of languages other than English, but also to speakers who, uh, speakers of minoritized varieties of English as well. Thanks, Obama. I, I just gotta put him at the end all the time. Thank you so much. Uh, this is how you find me and I'm happy to take your questions. Well, thank you so much. Um, that was amazing. And there was quite a bit of uh, uh, activity in the chat window, uh, a lot of comments um, coming in. So I'm gonna uh, try to pull out some, some questions that were, that were raised. Um, I, I, I'll start with a question of my own. Um, I was really interested in that clip that you played that the, where you had the four variations of o Obama and um, that you're only changing it by a semitone and um, on the high end and the low end, but um, and I, I uh, you know talk about uh, semitones and, and want to do the physics of music or whatever, and I feel like I'm pretty good at identifying um, semitone differences. That's that's pretty big musically. My question is, um, since I didn't think I heard a big difference between clip one and clip four, um, was that a common response for any of your uh, subjects that, that did that? Were there people that, that didn't hear a difference or I'm just so curious? We, we asked people like what they thought was happening <laughs> um, and they didn't seem to be all the way attuned to the fact that there were manipulations. Um, we didn't tell them that there were pitch manipulations. Um, they heard these clips. So everybody heard every clip. They heard all four versions of Obama saying that, but they heard all kinds of other stuff too. So it was mixed in with fillers. And also there, we had a question about whether they would judge him differently with creaky voice and things like that. Um, but nobody was like, oh, you moved his pitch around when he said the same thing. <laughs> um, and I do think it's subtle. The reason that I think it's harder to pick up on is you are expecting a fall and a rise and a fall in that phrase. 
it's the extent to which you get it that seems to be the difference. And it's, it's really not explicitly racialized, right? But we, I think we make by analogy to people we've heard before, and then that's why we're able to make that judgment, even if we're not conscious of the manipulation itself. Okay, neat. Um, I see one of the questions here was, what tool did you use to alter Obama's pitches? Uh, we just did this in Pratt manually. Um, if you're a linguist, this is free software. If you want to like real nerd out and you're not a linguist, um, you can put in clips and move, like stepwise manipulate pitches. Um, but we did it specifically on a existing phonological um, element that we suspected might be the thing that made the difference. So it wasn't just like randomly moving pitches. Okay, great. Um, I'm trying to see if there's, let's see. Um, so there was a, a question here. I understand that the focus of this talk is in racial identities, but I would like to know more about Nicole's take on what results you might find if you place the focus on gender diverse people. Examples could be trans women who had vocal surgery, trans men whose voices got deeper from testosterone and trans people who are trying to train their voice to sound a certain gender without medical intervention because of someone whose voice got deeper from testosterone I sometimes get clocked as trans, despite doing my, my damnedest to sound like a dude. <laughs> um, yeah, so I saw Ben Munson is in the audience. Uh, he's interested in this. Um, we've got some other linguists, right? So Lal Zeman, I think, is one of the main people that works on this kind of question. Um, if you're interested in that research, I am really not the person to ask about gender. Um, but I will say this, all of this stuff applies, right? So we were performing aspects of our social identity and they're never in a vacuum so when we're doing race we're also doing class we're also doing gender um, we're also doing age uh, and so the idea is to kind of construct a persona of who we think we are or who we want to be in these different settings and sometimes people are really uncomfortable with the idea that this is what's going on i think this is why i like studying politicians is because they're just very honest about the fact that they're always doing a persona but it's not bad we're just kind of different people in different settings so if who you are changes or if the way that you want people to see you changes then yes, obviously your voice is gonna come along with that. And I know there is a lot, there are apps and things now um, for trans people to, tra to train their voices um, towards a target that they want to have to be um, sort of authentically performing the, the person that they want to be seen as. Um, but that stuff is really fascinating because it also gets into some of the, the medical and physiological properties of the voice, which I'm a little bit less uh, knowledgeable about because that's articulation and I mostly do acoustics but there is some literature if you want to um, check that out I know that that's a really uh, growing area of, of sociophonetics. Another question uh, would you say teaching accent reduction is necessary in ESOL classrooms? It breaks my heart. <laughs> it really breaks my heart um, when it's L1 speakers of English who are being told that they need to um, change their accent. Um, I understand that if English is your L2, you have um, communicative goals that might be different and reasons that you um, want to change the way that you sound. And there are legitimate concerns for some folks about intelligibility, but I don't think that people should be pressured into changing the way that they sound. If you, if you sound like where you're from, great, you're from a place, everyone's from a place. So the biases that people have about, oh, you need to change your accent because it's too heavy are sometimes just these kind of ethnic and racial biases and not about the language itself. Um, I'd say like for an individual person, if they feel like they're not um, interpreted as intelligible or they don't like the way that they speak in their L2, then that's a perfectly appropriate solution. But I really don't like any sort of top down pressure to, to do that. Um, because it tends to also be kind of racist. Okay. Uh, I think that this next question kind of refers back to the Obama uh, study discussion that we were having. Uh, and the question is, did you find the listener identity affected perception? No, thank you for asking that. So one of the factors in the model was um, race of the listener and we had black and white listeners, but not others. Everybody was a American L1 English speaker. Um, and I thought maybe the black speakers would be more sensitive but it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, there's been some other work that, show, that has shown that black speakers are better, black listeners are better at identifying black speakers, um, but we don't really know if that's the case when we're looking specifically at intonational phenomena. But thank you, that was a good question. Okay, um, here's a question. Uh, can you say more about the role of media 
in people's responses to variation? And are things getting any better because we're exposed to more variation? I think cautiously, maybe they're getting a little bit better. Um, I have some work with a student, um, Marie Tano, who's at Pomona College, where I just left from, um, about how people evaluate African American language on Twitter. Um, and we really went in expecting people to say, um, oh, we really hate African American language the way that the tweets that we showed you did. But um, the raters in that study did not. Um, and it's not, you know, I'm not saying like, oh, there's no more racism, pack it up and go. No, I don't think that that's actually what happens. I don't even think that this is even an indication that there's less racism. Um, I think that African American language is more considered more acceptable on Twitter because of this exposure question that you're asking about. Um, that opens a can of worms related to who is allowed to use what kinds of language, which I don't want to adjudicate. Um, but I do think that people are increasingly exposed to varieties that aren't their own. That said, they're also exposed to ideologies about varieties that are not their own, which can be good or bad. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. I had a question. Do you think that biracial subjects feel more affected by code switching. I'm thinking about home life, how they would speak with their white parent slash family versus black parent slash family. Yeah, uh, I'm biracial. My dissertation was on biracial people. I've written a lot about Obama, also biracial. So you've asked the right person this question. Um, I get really nervous about the idea of like uh, what some scholars have called mixed race exceptionalism. So I don't think that multiracial people are special. I think that they're more likely to have experiences that cause them to be uh, conscious of this. So like where people have said the quiet part out loud about their racialized language ideologies. Um, I think about this stuff a lot because of my interactions with my family and different groups of friends. So I don't think that it's necessarily a function of the fact that people are biracial, rather it's a function of being in environments where you are asked to sort of explicitly think about um, language and race together. Okay. This is a question from Ben Munson, who you mentioned earlier. Hey ben Munson. <laughs> he says, I realize that this is a talk to a general audience, but can you comment on race as an uh, indexical field, the different social meanings that race conveys and the ways that we can measure these? When we ask about race, do we reduce the indexical field to being about race when something else might be the more primary percept? And, and I guess I just learned a new word. <laughs> these are, these are sociolinguist words. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, Ben Munson, you will probably be familiar with the paper Thomas and Racer 2004. This is a paper that talks about all of the studies where they've done ethnic identification tasks, like ask people, is this speaker black or white when they've played a clip and not shown a face. And um, one of the things that they find from looking at all of those studies is that there are some people that are more easily identified as black than others. Um, and those people are young and men and from the north. Um, and indeed, a lot of studies of African American language, especially earlier on, focused on a very specific type of black speaker. So there's a stereotype such that African American language speakers are um, young, black, poor men, straight men. Um, there aren't so many studies on like my grandma, who is also a speaker of African American language. Um, and the reason that the people in the Thomas and Reeser paper that they talk about the studies that were less successful in ethnic identification is that people don't have these heavy stereotypes about women, even though African American language is kind of stereotyped as male. Um, it has, AL has a lot of similarities with Southern white varieties. And so it's harder for people to tell black Southerners and white Southerners apart. They just hear Southern um, unless they're from, more familiar with the variety. So I think that, yeah, sometimes when we are looking at AAL, we're actually capturing stereotypes that people have about black speakers and not the language itself. So that's something to be con considered. Also, you know, some of the work that we have shows the ways in which white speakers use the indexical field of AAL. So when you have white kids using African-American language, they're usually trying to do it to portray some kind of urban, tough masculinity, all of the characteristics that they can come along with AAL. That's what they're trying to gain access to. But the problem is they only get the cool part and they don't get the damage. And that's why people have issues with kind of these thinking of it as an appropriation. All right. So uh, do you have studies of African English outside the USA? 
I don't. <laughs> um, but there are actually uh, a few people now working on stuff in West Africa. Um, my graduate advisor, Renee Blake, has been doing work in Ghana for several years. Um, and she's interested in how people use English and um, sort of code switching strategies in texting. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, I'm also interested in what happens to people who immigrate um, from different parts of Africa and their children, right? So whether they assimilate to African American English or not, because they have uh, these kind of social pressures in both directions, almost like the question that I got about the about multiracial people, what happens when you have all these exposures and all these different social pressures for how you'd like to portray your identity. Um, so stay tuned, I think there'll be more of that in the future. Great. Uh, any thoughts on individuals adopting vocal tendencies from those they spend a lot of time with. Sometimes I catch my friends and family catching on to certain vocal habits over time. Would love your thoughts. Yeah, I think this goes back to this kind of persona thing. So I happen to have looked at my own vowels, the way I pronounce my vowels um, when I was in college. So I grew up in Ohio and I went to college in Ohio. So I did this when I was like 21. I looked at my vowels again last year um, after five years in New York City and four years in California, and I never moved towards sounding like a New Yorker in the way that I produced my vowels. But I was in, Cal in California for about five seconds, and then I started saying things like cool instead of cool. <laughs> Um, and for me, at least my own experience there, um, I loved California. I wanted to be perceived as Californian. And so when I started hearing those vowels all the time, I was like, taking these vowels as my own. Um, so I think that's something that happens. And we also have, you know, various evidence from, in, in different types of features for convergence and divergence. So my colleague and co-author, Paul Reed, who's at the University of Alabama, looks at rootedness, um, that is how attached people are to a community, and finds that they do different kind of intonational stuff. He looks in East Tennessee, speakers in East Tennessee. The people who love East Tennessee and feel very proud and rooted to the community uh, use different patterns than the people who are trying to get out. Um, so I think we kind of move towards and away from the people we're around depending on how we feel about them. Okay, cool. Um, I just got to say, there's a ton of questions and, and these are all coming in and like, uh, Love I'm trying it. to, I'm trying to uh, <laughs> understand where this is coming from, but um, there's a follow-up. Uh, this is a follow-up to a previous answer that you gave, I think, um, uh, about when you were talking about listener identity. And the question is, do you think that listener identity didn't play a role because of the social context implied in the task? Like if it had been more specific, do you think listener identity would have had more of an effect? Yeah, I think that probably got a little flattened because it was Obama. Um, so, you know, the question of like, how black does he sound now is kind of weird because everybody knows, you know, what they think his race is. We wondered what would happen with other people, but then it's like, are you getting the language judgment? Or are you getting the judgment about like what people think their race is supposed to be if they don't know what their race is? Um, one thing that we did also look at in terms of the listener identity though was political affiliation, or we tried. Um, turns out it's very hard to find conservatives when you live in California and are doing an online survey about Obama. Um, so we weren't able to <laughs> include that um, as a factor, but I do think that you know, you always have to be conscious of all of the things about the way that your listeners and aspects of their identity might interpret the task. Okay. Um, beyond the idea of pressure to modify an accent, does this service send a message that, that there is a standard or a right way, or do you see a possibility of this service offering clear ways to speak in whatever manner, style, pattern a, a person chooses? Uh, I really, uh, you know, I think we need to unpack that idea of clear ways of speaking, right? People adapt to variation. They just do. Um, one, you know, very obvious example of this is if I say an ah, you know that it was an ah, right? If I say um, dog, you know that I said the canine thing, right? If uh, somebody who is a 70-year-old man who's uh, six foot five says dog, you also know he said dog. If there's a four-year-old child who is two feet tall and they say dog, you also know they said dog. Actually, the physical properties of our awes are real different because we're people of different ages and sizes. But our brains can do this, right? And so if our brains can do this, our brains can process the fact that somebody from the South uses their vowel in a slightly different place or that African-Americans might move things um, in the way that their tone works too. Um, 
I really feel pretty strongly that a lot of the ideas of people being unclear or like using language that's defective are really not about the language itself because we have a really incredible language capacity in our minds and a lot of social experience dealing with variation. Um, I, the sort of idea that there's a right and proper and clear target that everybody should be getting to is problematic in and of itself, I think. Okay. Um, how big is the research literature on code switching in immigrants? Any suggestions on lead researchers in this specialty? Uh, I ask because I noticed my husband switches his accent when he uses more Hindi in his speech than when he is talking to me and our white friends. I'd just like to learn more about this topic in general. Yeah, so there's a lot of literature on code switching. It's not quite what I do, right? I work in English uh, only um, in the United States, um, but if you go into Google Scholar and you type code switching Hindi and English, you will find, I would bet, several hundred papers. <laughs> um, it also depends on what you're interested in. So I think a lot of people first think of words, um, but there can be tone and sound things as well. Um, you know, I will tell you that as a general principle, um, code switching serves to do some kind of identity community solidarity type work. So even American English speakers will, you know, my grandmother is from Kentucky. If she talks to her relatives in Kentucky, she sounds totally different than if she talks to me, right? Um, so that's a sort of a, a very more subtle form of code switching. Um, but I think it's something that everybody does as part of this kind of persona construction thing that I was talking about. But yeah, you can find that stuff. There's a lot of it. Funny. All right. Um, there's gonna be another new word for me coming in this question. So uh, hopefully not a new word for me. <laughs> uh, probably not. Probably not. So thank you for a great talk in terms of social performance. Uh, are there situations where speakers might change super segmental and segmental features independently? Or do these features usually go hand in hand? I'm wondering if speakers suppress so called stigmatized segmental features and yet perform social identity just by manipulating pitch contour. Ooh, I feel like I know who this question came from. Okay, so uh, what this is asking is, can people manipulate like the vowels and consonants independently from the tone, right? So like, could you be using uh, features at one level, you know, in African American English and features at another level in Standard English? This is a good question that I also had. Um, so I gave a talk and I'm, I'm in the process of writing this paper last year at uh, a conference called New Ways of Analyzing Variation, where I looked at the corpus that I had of biracial men. And originally I was only interested in their intonation stuff, but I looked at their use of African-American English, a, a long list of African-American English morphosyntactic features. Um, it turns out that um, the the grammatical features correlate with whether they're speaking to white or black friends, but the intonational features don't. So that's like one thing already, like, whoa. Um, but also they don't use, even the ones that to me use what I'd say a, a lot of features of African-American English intonation, they still don't use a lot of features of the morphosyntax. So I think, yes, we do see a pattern in which they're avoiding the stigmatized, overtly stigmatized features, the things that people will call them out and say it's bad grammar. Um, but not necessarily avoiding the um, intonational stuff. So this is an old theory um, propagated by Elaine Tyrone in the 70s and then Arthur Spears in the 80s that for upper class and upper middle class black speakers, there's a thing called standard African American English and what it looks like is African American English tone and none of the grammar that's stigmatized. Hmm. So yeah, I think they can operate independently. Interesting. All right, uh, what overlap overlapping might there be between AAL speakers and those who display upspeak? Do you think individuals who produce both features will experience more prejudice and or be subjects of linguistic profiling? Um, okay, so <laughs> if somebody uses both AAL and upspeak, I think what they mean here is using a rising tone uh, at the end of a phrase where a falling tone might otherwise be expected. Um, if you have a person doing that, they are probably black and a woman. So yes, they're going to experience more prejudice um, by virtue of those things, but they're related, right? So you'll notice that the things that get stigmatized in society, the features, ebonics, bad grammar, zero copula, up talk, are not things that, you know, Donald Trump and Joe Biden are doing. They're things that are done by people that society already has some bias against. So young women in the case of Uptalk and black people in the, speaker, in the speech of AAL, AAL speakers. For a while, people thought that um, black speakers were not using Upspeak uh, or not using it as much. And I think they're still not using it as much. But like 
Beyonce does. So um, there might be a change such that um, young black women are starting to do both. And then, yeah, like they, it's the same thing, right? The double, the double bind, but also the double um, stigma that comes with being both a woman and a person of color. Um, and that happens linguistically as well. This actually kind of leads into a, a really nicely to the next question, which is you've been looking at Kamala Harris for a while. Anything stand out for you from her speech last night that others of us might have missed? Um, so, uh, you know, she's, <laughs> she does this thing in a very quick succession that I'd like to look at acoustically, but uh, the moment where she's talking about her family towards the beginning and she says, and my, uh, my family and uh, HBCUs and Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, um, which I jumped up and down. That's also my sorority. <laughs> and then she says, and my aunties and my titties, and she uses a Tamil word in the middle of a DNC speech, which has never happened. Um, I think that actually in the process of moving from speaking standard English, she's talking about her standard English family, right? And her husband and her stepkids who are, are white. And then she's talking about black people in her family and her black community. And then she's talking about Indian people in her family. And I think her vowels move around just in that like two sentences. Um, that's what I heard. I'd have to double check, but I think that's a pretty good um, sort of microcosm of what happens when she speaks. She's always just moving a little bit towards the persona that she's talking about, um, which is not weird. Like most politicians do that. Very interesting. So I, I think we have time for maybe one more question, uh, but I'll, um, so I wanna thank you so much for answering all these questions. And I wanna like thank everyone in the chat for this great discussion and that sort of thing. Um, and, and I apologize for any question that I skipped or missed or whatever, uh, that's my fault. Um, so, uh, but I wanna um, sort of end with this question. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm conducting a master's thesis on L2 listener listeners' interpretations of different dialects and accents op opposed to English L1 speakers. Any research tips for this? I'm more interested in the sociolinguistics aspect versus the actual physical properties of sound. I am very interested on the emotional response. Um, I'm sorry, can you read the part about the thesis itself again? Yeah. I missed yeah. something important, I think. L2 listeners' interpretations of different dialects and accents opposed to English L1 speakers. Oh, okay. So I think they mean of different uh, L2. So like if you're, your L1 is Spanish and you're hearing a bunch of different English speakers, how you're interpreting that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I did see some work at one point, I can't remember who, that basically sh showed that um, English speakers doing a study abroad program somewhere in the Spanish speaking country um, got the negative language ideologies uh that the community around them had so i think this might have been in peru oh this was devin graham and i remember who did this i think it was in peru where the indigenous people the variety that's spoken by indigenous people is heavily stigmatized um and so after a while the americans that were there would say oh yeah like the the way that the indigenous people sound is bad i'd expect that the same thing is going on um so that might be something you want to look for okay well, thank you so much. This was so fascinating. And uh, I'm really thrilled that we had such a great audience and such a great uh, engaging chat. And I really appreciate um, your time and being with us and sharing your, your uh, expertise with us. Of course. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was really fun. Thanks, everyone. Bye.